panel is going to talk about is how do we look beyond the horizon to those technologies that Tonio was talking about that aren't right there in front of engineers but are a little bit farther out. What do we need to do to make that a reality? And our moderator for the session is, uh, is Brian Walsh, who is a senior writer for Time Magazine and Time.com, where his focus is on environmental issues, uh, general interest and national interest stories. He writes the Going Green column for Time and uh, contributes to Time.com's environmental issues blog, Ecocentric. He was also a Tokyo Bureau Chief for Time and was named Senior Writer in April 2001 and is based up in New York. And he has a long background in, in these areas. He was awarded the Knight Public Health Journalism Fellowship from the Center for Disease Control. Uh, and he uh, is a graduate of Princeton University. Brian? Thanks very much, Robert. As you pointed out, um, you know, this is, we, we, we know, we, we talked earlier, I think, about some of the issues in terms of getting existing technologies out there and what role the government should or shouldn't be playing doing that, what the politics can and can't make possible. Here we'll talk about, I think, taking the next step, going to look beyond the horizon, find those technologies that, that are not ready commercially for prime time and, and, and figure out both what they are, how to develop them, and then I think also eventually how to scale them up as, as well. And uh, you know, it's obviously an incredibly important subject, and, and uh, even as we talk now, the Secretary of Energy is, is, is talking about Slinger right now on the Hill, and I've only been able to follow it by live tweet, but my big takeaway so far is that apparently he wishes he had a, had a time machine, which is something maybe RPE should be looking into, actually. In that. But, uh, so we have a great panel on this. Uh, immediately to my right, Dr. Ilan Gur, who is the Senior Advisor for Commercialization at RPE, and before that he served as founder and director at Seco Inc., which is a startup commercializing lithium batteries, uh, and he's also a faculty member at the UC Berkeley School of Business. Uh, to his right, we have Mike Schwenk, who's the vice president and director of commercial partnerships uh, for the Pacific Northwest Lab. Uh, nationally, he chairs the Industrial Research Institute's Science and Technology and Policy Committee. And lastly, uh, we have Samuel Thernstrom, who is a senior climate policy advisor at the Clean Air Task Force. Uh, his work is focused on clean energy innovation, and before that, he served at the White House uh, Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, just as we did in the, in the previous panel before lunch, we'll, we'll have each member talk uh, for about five to seven minutes, and then we'll do some questions here in the panel before opening it up uh, for some written questions from the audience. So, uh, if you have to start first. Great. Um, is this working? Hello? Yeah. How about now? Okay, great. Thanks, Brian. Pretty, just speak forward, I guess. Okay. So, perfect. Sorry. perfect. Um, so, uh, you know, I was asked from RPE's perspective to give a little bit of insight into the earliest stages of kind of the innovation process. And the, the sort of thing that came to mind, maybe the analogy was, um, I'm actually a, a recent uncle and have a, uh, have a nephew who's now two years old. And I think this is something that hopefully everyone here can relate to. Not everyone here, you know, we have a lot of PhDs at RPE. This is not a room full of PhDs. But, you know, when I watch my nephew play, um, oftentimes he's playing with something new. He's playing with blocks, etc. And normally it's just playing. And then you see these moments, right? And I think new parents experience this a lot, where these moments where you see that the child has kind of had some really strong insight, right? Oh, the, the block f is supposed to go in the hole somehow, right? And, and they're really powerful moments. And, and I'd say, when I think about sort of the innovation process and fundamental science, I think that's what scientists do. Um, I think we, we're generally exploring. We're trying to increase our knowledge base. And, um, and if you're lucky, you have these magic moments where you make a connection. And sometimes that connection leads to a new scientific insight, uh, a new way of understanding the world. Sometimes that connection leads to something which, which may be practical. Um, and and may, maybe I'm, I'm overly romanticizing science because ultimately, you know, when you do this in science, you know, the, the process is not a playing process. It's, you know, it's hard work. It's tons of experiments. Most of them don't work. And, uh, and the epiphanies don't come that often. But uh, I guess I'd give a personal example. Um, before RPE, and actually, you know, before I worked on my battery company, we, uh, um, 
in graduate school, I worked, I was lucky enough, they say graduate school is all about your advisor, I was lucky enough to have a phenomenal advisor, a man named Paul Olivasados, one of my personal heroes, who's now the director of Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And when Paul was doing his PhD and postdoctoral work, he was really in the mode of science and exploration. He was really interested in seeing what happens when you take materials and you make them at a very small scale, on the nanometer scale, so tens of thousands of times smaller than the thickness of a hair, right, very small. And and he stumbled upon a lot of really new insights on how materials fundamentally behave at that, at that scale. Um, and he had several of these moments, one of which was, was when you shrink materials down to this scale, fundamental properties of the material all of a sudden start to change, like how much light a material might absorb or what spectrum of light a material might absorb. And you know, one of these moments was, well, we struggle with solar panels and solar, you know, harvesting solar energy because we take materials which don't necessarily do a good job of absorbing solar light and we try and convert the light to electricity. Now, making these very small materials, maybe we could tailor a material that could perfectly absorb solar energy. Okay? And that was a really dramatic moment and I think one of these moments similar to what I see when I watch my nephew play. If you fast forward the story, and I think one of the challenges at the time was he had been doing basic science and now he had this insight of, hey, maybe this basic science phenomenon could be used for something practical. And the question was, well, what next? And if you looked at the structure of, of funding and support for innovation, um, you know, at least within DOE, you have the Office of Basic Science, which does phenomenal work on promoting that exploration and finding those insights. And then we have the applied research programs, which support really pushing things towards right, a, an actual application. But this was somewhere in between, right? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't clear whether this phenomenon could be used or couldn't be used. And so in this story, you know, Paul continued to get funding and over the course of, you know, eight or nine years until I showed up in his lab, it just slowly sort of evolved and finally got to a point where it looked like, yes, this actually could probably be used for this application. And, uh, and I was able to work on this project in a much more applied way. Um, but there was, there was kind of this gap. So I guess what I'd say is RPE is really, has been created and, and is trying to sort of fit that middle ground, right? And say, we want to capture these moments, right? These, these moments of, of, of the nephew playing, of, of Paul sort of thinking about science. And we want to say, rather than go through that long, arduous process to get it from something that was basic science in an inefficient way, let's support that, that moment and that insight and let's try and drive it very quickly and see whether it can actually work. And as you can imagine, what that means is we're supporting a lot of really groundbreaking technologies, ideas which it's not clear whether or not they'll work, right? So to go back to the analogy, my nephew will sometimes pick up the square block and put it in the square hole and he'll try it first and he won't make it, right? He'll put it in the wrong way and he'll keep hitting the walls. And he might be taking it and putting it in the square hole. He might be taking it and putting it in the triangle hole. Either way, the first 10 times he smacks at it, it's not going to go in. But if it's the square hole, it eventually will go through. And so there's this idea of, you know, for some of these projects, we're not sure <laughs> whether we're trying to put the block in the square hole or, or the triangle hole. But if we do get it through the square hole, it could be a really big win. Um, and so for us, we're looking for these, these really these insights, these innovations, which if they succeed could be a big win in energy. Uh, we're a very mission-driven agency, um, so a big win in energy for us means dramatic reductions in, in um, avoiding energy, foreign energy imports, in, in our energy use in the U.S. generally, and in emissions related to energy. Um, if I have just a minute, just a couple examples of that, of, uh, you know, we have some indicators now of projects um, and of programs where we are starting to see that, hey, it looks like we did find a block that's going to fit. Um, and sometimes these insights innovations are coming at a program level. So I think you heard from Arun this morning about programs like our electrofuels program, right, which is can we take electricity and make fuels 10 times more efficient than, than photosynthesis, right? This was, an, this was a case where we had a program director Eric Toon, who came into RPE, he had been working on microbiology that had nothing to do with energy or photosynthesis and said, here's a whole different way to do it. He made one of those connections and we have a program and we have, you know, 10, 12 teams who are all looking at different approaches based on this kind of insider inf innovation. We have a project at MIT which is, um, had been working on research around aluminum smelting and made a connection to batteries. 
And so they had the idea of maybe we can make a battery for the grid, which is based on technology normally used in aluminum smelting, liquid metals at very high temperatures. We funded them to do a prototype at a very small scale, and now they've proven the concept, which was at first it was sort of, ah, well, we don't know whether that'll work or not. They've proven the concept, and now they're trying to build a much bigger prototype. And we've seen that after we've been able to support them, you know, private investors, Bill Gates and others, corporations are now working with them. Similar project in, um, in drilling, uh, basically looking at lasers um, and, and the innovations that have had happened for, in lasers over the years. Lasers are becoming much more powerful than they used to be at much lower costs. Uh, and one of our awardees had the idea of, hey, could we take this set of technology advances and apply them to drilling for geothermal energy or for otherwise other sources of energy in hard to reach places? And, and again, we sort of supported the proof of that concept, the initial prototypes, and we've seen a lot of other companies in the private sector get involved. So those are just a couple examples um, and, and where we sit. And, and I think certainly for the cases where the innovation and the insight comes in a university or a national lab or even a small company, the scientist alone can't do everything to get it out into the world. So I think, I think that's kind of where we're moving with the conversation is, is what are the next steps. But hopefully that gives a little perspective on, on that first piece. Great. Thanks so much. I'm very excited about RB's future block through hole advanced project. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Uh, go ahead, Mike. And so uh, three or four years ago, I was speaking to a chamber of commerce. Uh, and you, know, you go through the usual, hi, I'm from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. We're one of DOE's multi-program national labs. We do about a billion dollars of research a year. We have 5,000 people. And we disclose inventions at the rate of one every working day. And I paused there and I looked at the audience and I don't know what came to me, but I, I just sort of said, do you think that's good? And the audience stared back, kind of like you all are right now. Let's see, a billion dollars, 5,000 people, an invention a day. Is that good? And the reactions were, were varied until somebody in the back of the room said, it depends. <laughs> and I thought about that, and I, I cornered the person later, and, and in that person's mind, it was, well, if, that w if there was one invention and it was the cure for cancer, one is a good number. <laughs> and I thought about that, but later on began to ask as I drove away, a little bit different point of view about it depends. And that is, what does the technology transfer process depend on? And so we went back and we did a pretty self-critical evaluation of uh, any way you'd look at, the standard way you'd look at any work process, which is, hey, there's an input, there's some sort of value added that you're supposed to do to that input, and then there's an output. So let's look at the technology transfer and commercialization process, at least in the national laboratory system, and take a critical look at that. The typical tech transfer office runs like this. You get up in the morning, you come to work, you hope somebody discloses an invention, you take a look at it, you go and you talk to the inventor, and then you say, well, I don't know, should we invest in patenting this thing and go through three or four years and several thousand dollars? At the end, it's patented, and then you sort of spin your Rolodex or go to a meeting or put it on your website, and you hope somebody will call and say, I'm interested in licensing that invention. I mean, that's sort of the, you know, the, sort of the self-critical uh, way in which that process works. And the tech transfer practitioner community works really hard to try and optimize that method. But I asked the question, all right, fine, but what is it that we have to work with? I mean, let's look upstream at where the inventions come from. And it was a very interesting view of the research enterprise. And what we found was, I would call it a very, very boutique-y kind of enterprise, where basically it's a model where if you're a researcher and you can find a sponsor for the work you want to do, you're good. And in that sense, it's a very, very sort of um, principal investigator centric. It's very uh, disconnected kind of an R&D model. And from that, uh, you, are, you have a, a sort of a system of hope where maybe they'll even disclose their inventions, but they don't think about technology transfer. They don't think about commercialization. In the R&D funding model, they're worried about how am I going to get the next sponsor to continue uh, funding the work that I want to do. So that didn't feel very good to me, and I said, well, all right, that's the input side. What about the output side? And the output side of the tech transfer process is, well, we put stuff on a website, we put it in federal business opportunities, we'll try and market it in some way to somebody we think might be interested, and we look for a licensee, cut the deal with the licensee, and, and hope they're successful with it, and we get some royalties back. 
And that didn't feel too good to me either, and that's sort of a system that's uh, generally, across the board, one that's built on serendipity, uh, where I think you just sort of hope. You hope a great invention comes in on any given day. You hope years later, after you finish patenting it, that somebody's going to want it and you're going to license it to them, and you hope they're successful with it. So none of that felt very good. I think it's a system that you, sh you should allow uh, for that, that great idea that does come forward and always be prepared to accommodate it. But in my mind, I think the question back to that Chamber of Commerce crowd was, hey, that's a billion dollars of your tax money. Uh, are, are we being as efficient with that as we might be? So we started retooling that at our national lab uh, to have a more strategic approach about how you might go about this process. Could the tech transfer office actually work with the research and development people at the beginning of an R&D program and think through What's the nature of the research? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Who's on the team? What's the intellectual property state you might create? Who else has complementary IP out there that might be a collaborator, be it at a university or an industry? And how is it we could actually find white space in which we could optimize the direction of that research and say sort of invent here because no one else has and try and do this in a smarter sort of a way? While you're doing that, then we know how to capture IP. We can think about um, uh, patenting strategies around that. You can look at your collaborators and you can actually think about the commercialization process not in a linear way but actually in parallel and right along with the, while the R&D enterprise is unfolding. So we started doing that and then began looking at the other side which was the output side and we said well you know what a lot of the things we work on it isn't as easy as just licensing it to somebody. So much of what you heard this morning in previous panels was absolutely true. Things about regulatory issues, financing issues, political issues, policy issues, all get in the way of a lot of the things that we're working on. If we're going to have a smart grid in the United States of America, <coughs> begin to th this is not a technological issue as much as it's going to be a huge regulatory policy and a whole host of other, you know, broader sort of economic development issues. And those, that community needs to understand where the research is going, what it's going to bring to them, and be able to work alongside. Uh, and all this then has been what's now characterized as the innovation ecosystem. We heard it repeatedly this morning. Everybody's talking about it. A day can't go by. You all don't see some reference to it. And it's real. So the issue is, to me, it's a psychological one more than it is anything else. It's um, how do you make the system come alive? How do you get researchers who are not used to working with tech transfer people, who are not used to working with economic development people, and that whole system to actually sit in a room and work together with one another? Policy, regulators, and, and, and do that. And to me, the psychological principle that makes that system work, like any system, no matter what it is, it's designed for some end. Systems are designed to achieve some end. You have to start with the end in mind. And to me, this has been the power of recent conversations about the National Innovation Strategy having grand challenges. It's the notion of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does the exact same thing. They have grand challenges for their, the, the health campaigns that they're mounting worldwide. IBM has grand challenges. Many, many, many forms of these, and they're all scalable, by the way. They can be national ones, but they don't have to be. They can be lesser ones, whether it's the sunshot dollar or what. I mean, there's lots of things that you can do uh, to, to, to make that system sing. But when people rally to the cause, they'll sit down and they'll work together because they know they can't solve it by themselves. So you have to create the reason for these different communities from research to commercialization to deployment to scale up to regulatory to policy. You have to give them a reason to collaborate. You can't just wish it or will it on people. And the way is to rally around a goal. So that's why we applaud so many of the things that we're seeing uh, in these initiatives. I think the, the, the theories behind uh, a hub, uh, the hubs that are being created, the ARPAEs that have been created, um, there's a lot of innovation ecosystem, I6 challenges and grants that have gone out there. There's a whole lot of these things. But here's my question. Are those sustainable? Were they flashes in the pan? Will they be around two years or three years from now? Are we going to have three hubs, four hubs, five hubs, and then no hubs? I mean, I think the bigger question that we're faced is how do you quote unquote institutionalize this across the system and make that whole system sustainable, be it any national lab or the entire national lab system, including uh, the university partners and industry partners that need to be a part of this. So to me, in a world now where we're being asked to do more with less, I think the question we're faced with is how do we do different? 
Great. Sam? That's a great place for me to start with, actually. Um, because I wanted to say, you know, this is, this is a, a, a great opportunity for me. This is actually the largest uh, innovation uh, conference I think I've ever attended. I wasn't here last year because I was very sick, but uh, this is a great crowd here. Um, and when you look at all these people gathered together, uh, you start to get the feeling that maybe we have a little bit of an innovation movement here. Um, and, and that's a kind of exciting thing, and especially for someone like me, I work for an environmental advocacy organization, and so building movements and political coalitions is what advocacy organizations are supposed to do, and that's the general model for how you build a sustained effort over time. And I think the most important thing I could say to all of you today is I actually think, I really want to warn strongly against the movement mentality as, as a way of engaging with the innovation enterprise, um, because I, I think that's maybe one of our biggest uh, potential perils in this issue. Um, when I was driving in here this morning, I heard uh, the radio uh, announcing Secretary Chu's, you know, line of the day as he was heading up to the hill. He's decided to mount a, a strong offense as a good defense. And his, his line was, we have a simple choice to make we, uh, on energy innovation. We can compete or we can accept defeat. And I would say, you know, it's, it's a little mean of me to pick on Secretary Chu on a day when he's having a hard time anyways, but, but I really think that that's the wrong way to think about this. Um, we do not have simple choices on innovation. We have a lot of complicated choices on innovation. Um, and our choices are not simply compete or defeat. They are, in fact, also to cooperate on innovation. And to think about the innovation system as, yes, being the National Labs and ARPA, and I'm, I'm all in favor of what those guys are doing, but I actually think that we need to think about innovation as a global issue and focus on the fact that, at least from the environmental point of view, which is what I care about, what we care about is advancing the technologies and not necessarily advancing American competitiveness per se. I think America will get a piece of the action, but it's not, that's not what the issue is all about. I do have just a few slides. Let's see if I can actually move through them. So, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I think the point. Just go sort of lose on mic. Okay, so, yeah. sorry. Look straight ahead. <laughs> so, um, you know, the point I want to make is that I really think that it's it's hard for us to all to come together here at a conference like this and say, "Gee, we 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 don't." actually know the answers. I mean, follow me, I'm thinking hard about the questions is not much of a, a rallying cry for most people. Um, but I do think that's the honest place to start the conversation on innovation, is that these are very complicated issues. We don't have a formula that's an answer for all of them. There are a lot of different pieces and that we need to always remember that each element of the innovation puzzle is actually different. So what the story is on PV is different from wind, is different from nuclear, is different from fossil. And, and to try to make broad generalizations about these questions is very difficult. And that if, you, if we go out with the line that you know, we know what we're doing, uh, I, I think that's the first place to, uh, I, I think that's the beginning of failure. So, um, and the Solyndra story, I think, is, is a great example of, of what I'm talking about, that the, the um, peril is that people feel, well, we're part of an innovation movement and we believe in innovation, so you know, we need to circle the wagons and defend the Solyndra story. Nothing, nothing went wrong there. That's just a price of doing business. That's part of uh, what we do if we're taking risks. And I actually really think that's the wrong way to think about that. I think there are important lessons to be learned from the Solyndra story. I don't think it's entirely clear uh, how much the issue there is politics and how much is the design of the program or maybe a, a bit of both. But if that's if, if the Solyndra outcome is, is what the program was designed to produce, uh, I think that really will be its epitaph. Uh, I don't think we'll have uh, a continued loan program if we simply say that's, you know, that's a price of doing business. Um, in, in a larger sense, I think that we need to try to free ourselves from the assumption that energy innovation is uh, an American issue with a DC solution. You know, all of you I'm sure know the, the saying, if you have a hammer, everything looks like nails. Well, I mean, here in DC, we're all here because we think this is the center of the universe and, and we can control the innovation problem through federal policy and get the budget right, get the RPE you know, uh, con formula right, and that it's all gonna fall into place. I don't think that's really the story. I think that what's happening in, in innovation is much more complicated and it's much more global and yes, the national labs have an important piece of it, but I actually think the global energy economy and how the innovation system integrates into that is the really interesting story. 
Um, and, and that gets me to the basic question of what is innovation? You know, the, I think the point of this panel is we're supposed to think about, we're talking about breakthrough technologies, the real game changers, long-term things. And uh, my point is that I actually think that there is, the distinction there is not as sharp as many people think. A lot of people think that, you know, these breakthrough technologies are going to come out of the labs and presto, <coughs> boom, change the world, and that we can just wait for them. And that, meanwhile, you know, on incremental innovation, we just got to kind of work on, on moving things along, but that's not so exciting. That's not big game-changing stuff. And I don't think that's the story at all. I think actually tomorrow's technologies are often, you know, yesterday's or 10 years ago's old ideas that have actually been turned into reality. And the innovation process is a process of taking ideas and turning them into reality. So people who are in business tell me that if you in invent a better mousetrap, you know, you, you've done 1% of the job. 99% of the job is taking your mousetrap and doing everything that's involved in actually bringing it uh, on, up to commercial scale. And so how do you do that? Uh, that's the question that we're all wrestling with here, and, and you know, as I said right off the bat, I don't think there is one simple, single answer that applies to all of these different situations by any means, but since the imperative of talks like this is to pretend that there is a simple answer, I'll, I'll offer a couple uh, formulas. Um, uh, and, and I guess, you know, the, the, I'd start with the, the basic point that I think stasis is, is the enemy of innovation and that movement is its greatest ally. And, and our problem in, in Washington is that we're, and our problem with innovation is that, is that too often things are sitting on the shelves and we're not moving. And what we need to do is think about ways to actually move forward with them. And so I'll move on to my next slide. And I'll just, I'll, you know, I, I can skip over the top half of the slide. I think all of you uh, are probably familiar with these general numbers. The, you know, the question I put, is, put up is where should we be looking for innovation today? And if you look at those first three bullets there, um, they tell you what the basic build is going on right now in China. And it's astonishing. Uh, China, just in the last 10 years, has built more coal-fired capacity than we have in this entire country. Almost half of all the new nuclear reactor construction going on right now in the world is happening in China. And not all that is innovative, innovative of course, but some of it is, uh, which led uh, New York Times energy writer Matt Wall to run a column, I think it was in March, that was titled, The American Nuclear Renaissance is Going Strong, It's Just That It's in China. And, uh, and indeed, if you, if you think about where all the new designs in, in nuclear uh, energy are coming out, they're in China. The AP-1000, they're building four of them now. That's started to drive commercialization in the U.S. They're building the first-of-a-kind pebble bed reactor there. And the Chinese are launching a thorium pro research program, uh, you know, picking up on American uh, technology. And so the bottom line story is that if you're not working on energy innovation in China, you're really missing the boat. And I just very briefly, I want to walk you through um, one specific example of what I'm talking about. I talked earlier this week with the CEO of a company called PowerSpan, and I just thought I'd just very quickly tell you the power span story because I think it's a good example of, of the things I've been talking about. You know, the bottom line, you got me there? Okay. The bottom line from, from power span is, you know, this is a company that is based in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, but I talked to Frank uh, through Skype uh, and he was in China on Monday. And uh, it's no surprise because Frank's basic message to me was, if China didn't exist, we wouldn't be in business. This is a company with a very uh, cutting edge proprietary technology that uh, seems to be uh, uh, more cost competitive than, there, than other uh, alternatives out there to scrub multi-pollutants, but particularly CO2, out of flue gas. They had about 10 to 12 years of R&D in the US, had $100 million in venture capital funding lined up. They were ready to build a first of a kind plant in Ohio, and then the recession hit, and, and so, uh, those deals fell apart. They started looking around the world. They found that uh, even though Europe talks a lot about CCS, the opportunities to actually do something in Europe were very, very limited, but that the Chinese market was very open. And so that's where they've taken their product. And Frank you know, walked through the basic advantages for him of doing business in China, and they're really quite striking. Um, first of all, culturally, uh, it was just interesting. Frank says, you, you go to big American companies with some new technology, their basic response is, we're skeptical. We're the big boys. You're some little startup. 
Why, why should I believe you've got a better widget? Well, if you go to China, actually, he says, people there presume you have a better technology. That's, they take that for granted, and they're interested in learning how to capitalize that. Then talk about just the fundamentals of business, speed, price, and capital. In China, Frank says he can build things in a third to a half the time, roughly speaking. This is a whole mentality of build, 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 24-7, 365 days a year. Price for him doing business in China is 20% or less of what it would cost in the United States and even less than it would cost in Europe to do similar things. Um, and of course the capital issue, I, I am wrapping up, I, get, I see that look in your eyes. Um, and of course the capital issue, you know, in, in, in the US uh, financing is very expensive on, on these big capital intensive plants and in China it's very easy because that's what they're doing all the time. Um, and then, you know, you know, you all might say, well, so what's the value of this? Okay, so they're, you know, building some of this stuff in China, but what does that do for the world? Well, in fact, PowerSpan has, because of their experience in China, they now have a joint venture with Huanang Power, where they are taking their technology into the Middle East and into European markets. This is a key technology for making carbon capture and sequestration feasible. To me, that this is much more of the model for how we can actually make innovation happen. It's not so much, you know, not to denigrate the importance of our great national labs and RPE and all that stuff. I think that that all has an important part to play in the picture, but I, I do think when we sit here in Washington, it's easy to think that this is all an American issue, this is all about American competitiveness and American companies and the DC, you know, the federal budget, and I think that the picture is much more complicated and much broader. Thanks very much. So you sort of uh, almost like a humble energy policy. A humble energy policy. A humble innovation. I've heard that before. A, or a humble approach to thinking about innovation policy. I think. Well, is I don't. I guess I, what I wonder is, I mean, why these two things can't necessarily coexist. I mean, of course, China, because of, by dint of its size, but the the speed at which it needs to add energy capacity, uh, by by virtue of its business culture and political culture, I mean, is going to be the place where this will happen. And of course, that is happening. I mean, there are relationships, partnerships on the federal level between. The U.S. and China. So, uh, there are companies like I know, you know, Duke Energy. They're going and working on CCS over there as well. Right. Why can't? I mean, why? 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 Why not both? I mean. It, it, These almost seem like slightly separate issues to me. They're, they're not separate issues. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I, I, I don't say you have to choose between them, but I think they're closely related. The, you know, I started talking about Solyndra. Uh, I, I think the whole point of Solyndra is that, or, or not the whole point, but part of the point there is that, you know, there was this excessive focus on on innovation as a stimulus measure rather than innovation as a goal in and of itself. And so if you're trying to get an American solar industry started, well maybe you need to fund these very expensive projects that are very risky and you know uh, don't always work out like Solyndra. If what you're looking for is actually a way to drive innovation and you set aside questions of you know American competitiveness, American jobs, which I think are really distracting and confusing, then you're left with a system where you're looking for actual market opportunities to bring technologies to scale. And to me, that's the heart of the innovation process. Innovation isn't, yes, you know, what, what, what's done in the national labs is great, but the core of innovation, in my mind, is a multi-decade process of engineering and refinement that actually happens in the field. And that's just not going to happen in this country because our energy demand isn't big enough. We're not building things here on a scale that supports that level of constant innovation. So, yes, don't choose between the two, but let's not... Let's, let's have our focus appropriately on where the real action is, which I think is more in the global markets and less in America. I think we should start gathering questions just so we get on that. Um, Elon, Mike, I wonder, where do you, I mean, does this, is the, I mean, can America still play that role? I mean, that final role of, of that last part of the innovation chain? Or is it, are we now sort of ceding that to, to another bigger market? We're over to stick. Um, well, I mean, I, th I think it's a, I think it's a tough question. Uh, I'd say certainly one of the, yeah, you know, we're, we're drifting from my area of expertise, but I'd say, you know, one of the luxuries we don't have is the ability to support risky new technologies for the sake of economic development and say, yes, we're putting this money into creating jobs if the technology doesn't work. You know, if the technology happens to work, that's a bonus, right? And, and I get the sense that if you look at some place like China, you know, they do have to, to play in that in that way, um, I, I, I guess I would draw from 
from my experience, just thinking about the, the, uh, the different phases and the different pieces of this, I mean, I think ultimately it does have to be really an alignment uh, of these efforts and, and an alignment of these various types of support. When, when I started thinking about solar energy and working on solar energy, um, you know, there really was no grid connected global solar market. Right? If you told someone, I'm going to start a company and make 100 megawatts of solar a year and people are going to put them on their roofs even though they're connected to the electricity grid, you know, the experts in the field around the world would have looked like at you as though you were completely crazy because that didn't exist. It wasn't until, you know, certain countries, you know, initially Germany, Japan said, you know what, we really do see an opportunity to drive the cost of solar down and we do see some initial markets where this could be competitive and so we're going to substitute that and you know for me to go from then to 10 15 years later when all of a sudden they, you know the market went from a two four hundred million dollar market to a fifty billion dollar market right and and meanwhile the cost of solar had come down by an enormous you know uh, just a what would have been an unbelievable you know factor um, you realize that you know the, the technology we're developing in the lab is is only a piece of it and, and I guess I'd also say you know, I mentioned the story before that you know what, when I started you know I started working on our t on the solar technology that I was developing in 2002 in 2006 we spun that off into a company the initial scientific that that insight that innovation had come in the early 90s, mm -hmm. right? And you wonder if when that first innovation had happened, there was really the support then to drive it and say, here's an opportunity, let's get behind it. And rather than have that be a 15 year cycle, let's try and develop something in a five year cycle. Um, you know, the, the, the history could have changed. It, it could have looked different. So, so I think there's, there's a lot of alignment that needs to happen across mm -hmm. the board. Mike, you asked, you asked in, your, in your talk about, you know, is, is RP going to be sustainable? Are, are these labs going to be there in the future? What, what does that uncertainty do? You know, uh, just what Willem was just talking about. I mean, if, if this had been there, if the structure had been there when some of this work was being done, maybe we would have sped this up. Does this does it hold it back, that uncertainty, not knowing will this funding be there in the future, actually probably knowing it may not be there in the future? Well, certainly, I think... Uh, uncertainty, uh, for example, drives industry crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if you uh, want public-private partnerships and you want industry to collaborate with the federal laboratory system, there has to be something besides, uh, there has to be more certainty than the annual appropriations of Congress or the, the, the you know, the political swings that says well, RPE, RPE was then, and but it's not now, or hubs are now and not tomorrow, or you know, you just, you can't do that. Because um, uh, industry will just say, forget it. Uh, we don't want to play, it's too volatile. Um, and so what you do is you, you begin to, I think, diminish the ability for your, your federal laboratory, your federal R&D investment to sort of, um, uh, well, partner uh, with those who are going to put it into practice, put it into use, and actually ultimately deploy it. Okay. We'll take one question from, from the audience first. This is for you. Uh, how do we know when a technology is actually ready to scale? <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> Uh, that's you know that that's a tough one, and I think it goes to some of the some of the stuff that Mike was talking about earlier. Um, you know, when you look at this process initially, you know, and, and Mike was talking about basically how you know we develop, we can do, we can do a lot of inventing mm -hmm. at our universities, right? But if you're just inventing and you don't know what it's connected to and you don't know where the value is, then most of those inventions aren't going to be worth much. And it's true, and it actually I think that goes to the, the crux of the issue of, of this, you know, what, what we like to call sort of the interface between a technology push and a market pull, which is when you think about our universities, we want to be exploring, we want to be doing science, and yet anyone who's been in the business world who's tried to take a technology to market will tell you that, you know, developing a technology in the absence of, of what the real needs are of the application of the market isn't going to get you anywhere, right? Great technologies fail right and left. And so at some point you have to pivot to saying, okay, we went from exploring an interesting technology, having insights, to we're now developing this widget for this application, and here's the value, and here's what people will pay for it. Um, and the crux of when is it ready to scale, I think, is a question of one, how, I mean, how well have you validated those two components? How well have you validated, did you build the technology? 
in a way that Right, looking at a dynamic marketplace, you know, uh, the the folk folks in the market will pay money for what you've built mm -hmm. now in five years. And did you validate the technology such that you'll have enough confidence in in it working? And and I think the question of what is the confidence level needed to support these technologies um, is is a big issue because mm -hmm. uh, you know here in the United States that confidence level for investors for you know back financing for manufacturing plants for for building projects um, you know we're pretty conservative in that regard here um, and, and so you 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 then need to ask yourself at least in our environment what is the role of government if if the private sector is extremely conservative on making those pushes mm -hmm. so for you know we're talking about policy and, and creating a market what is the in your view at least what is the relationship between this kind of innovation for advanced energy technologies and policies that would support deployment. Uh, are the two almost separate? I mean, right now, as you know, we have billions of dollars in subsidies that go to essentially subsidize existing renewable energy technologies, big solar thermal plants, uh, wind turbines. Is that part of this ecosystem or is that almost a political separate, separate part? I, I, I do think it's part of it. I, I think that I am a big believer that we should have a more innovation focused set of policies, not deployment focused. But I also think at the same time, you know, we should acknowledge that obviously uh, deployment centered policies do drive a certain amount of innovation. It's just very hard to know how much and I'm not sure it's the most efficient thing. So there's, you know, been a lot of debate in the literature about, you know, the, the German and Spanish, you know, very generous subsidies for solar PV, for instance, which, you know, drove a lot of deployment of not especially innovative PV. And so it's easy to say, well, boy, that was a big waste of money. And I think it actually, it was something of a waste of money. I think there was a lot of inefficiency there. But I wouldn't take it so far as to say, and therefore we got nothing from that because obviously part of the innovation system is, is a crude process of when you put a lot of money into it, people, you know, innovators get a sense that there's a market out there and they, and they invest more. And so innovation is a very complex process. It's messy. It's, it's uh, a matter of providing funding for government labs, but it's also a matter of sending psycho psychological signals to the markets. These things, they cut both ways. I think when private companies look at, at, at the German and and Spanish experience now, they might think, well, wow, you know, there was a very generous subsidy, but mm -hmm. it wasn't sustainable and the rug got pulled out, and so maybe that's a bad deal. So I, I, I would say that I, I think it's valuable to focus on the distinctions between innovation policies and deployment policies, but I would also say let's be mindful of how um, fuzzy those distinctions can be and how complicated it is to actually untangle all the threads. If it is a crude process, not a perfect machine, I mean, do we expect to lose money along the way? I mean, that, that, that whether it's, you know, Slinger is probably not a great example, but whether it's, it's bets that won't necessarily work out or research projects that eventually don't pay, pay off, I mean, that's, if we can't control within can't uh, know. Of course, everything. of course, that's part of the process. But, you know, your earlier question was, how do we know when a technology is ready to scale? And I think the answer is, well, when there's a market for it. And that's how you figure these things out. It isn't, you know, some, isn't that whatever, the North Star shines bright. Um, it's, you know, PowerSpan has a technology, it's ready to scale because they were able to take it to China where they were able to do a demonstration project, prove out the actual cost and performance of the technology, and then start looking at global markets where they could say, this is, this is what we have, this is how it works, let me sell it to you. That's how you know it's ready to scale. Mm -hmm. This is another question that sort of follows up on that from, from the audience, um, for anyone. Really, what do you think of the, uh, the quadrennial technology review? Uh, and whether, is there a benefit to, to road mapping uh, these sort of technologies? I think anyone can take that who wants to grab it. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I'd have a very quick answer, mm -hmm. which is I think there's a huge benefit in in pulling together and assessing what are we doing mm -hmm. and being able to look at that information and say, okay, here is our portfolio. I mean, and I, I, this goes back to, I guess, you just mentioned this question of, you know, taking risks and losing money. You know, are we going to lose money necessarily? I mean, I, right, at RPE, we're, we're an agency that's been created to be risk takers. Mm -hmm. and, and what that's got us to realize is that when you think about risk, I mean, I think a lot of folks operate on a principle, principle of risk mi mitigation, right? Risk minimization. Especially in the city, I imagine. And I wasn't going to say it, but, but you, right. I'm but, not from but here, maybe okay. especially in the city, right? Yeah. And
And I think for us, we like to think about this as, no, you, you need risk optimization, right? Mm. There are times where it is worth taking risks necessarily because you do want to get the wins and without taking the risks you won't, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if my nephew didn't, I hate to go back to it, right? But if my nephew never picked up the block and did anything with it, he'd never learn anything, right? Mm. And so, you know, for us, we see ourselves, we think about that within our agency. We also think about RPE in the context of the broader DOE, mm -hmm. right? And the DOE needs to have a risk optimization policy. And I think one thing that, that the quadrennial review does is allows DOE to say, okay, here's what we are doing. And so now we can actually start thinking about what that optimization looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's very powerful in that regard. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's a tremendous document. I'm, I'm going to butcher a quote that's in there, but it's something the effect that if all we can say at the end of the day is that we've done some interesting science, then shame on us. And and so the idea of the QTR is, hey, let's aggregate some effort, let's get focused, uh, let's have some you know, grand challenges, let's have some ends in mind that we want to say we can achieve and we can accomplish. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the road mapping structure, however that comes out, um, is a way to do exactly that. And it's, in my view, needed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would I would agree with all that. I, I think the QTR is, is a good thing. I think the one thing I would ask for would be uh, to step it up a level. I think I think we need a quadrennial energy review. We need an energy policy, not a technology and review. That was and, and PCAST's that is, original recommendation. Right. There still is. I guess. Right. Yeah. Sam, I wonder you know, to go back to the Shana example, and I, you know, I'm fascinated by there too. And I'm wondering. What ha over time? So you really don't believe in the competition argument at all? I mean, the sense that. You know, n not just the job issue, but I mean that there's no doubt that one of the we don't certainly don't have an advantage on low cost manufacturing, but we do have the best universities. We do still have the best sort of those best science, best best labs. I think. Do we risk losing that? Is or you know with these sort of relationships or, or seeing that happen in, in China, or is that just as you point out, this is a, a global phenomenon now, and that's going to happen? I, I mean, I wouldn't obviously. I wouldn't say there are no risks, and you know. The, the sun is always shining, mm -hmm. um, but I would say that on the whole, I, I think the the competition dynamic is uh, overstated and unhelpful from an innovation point of view. Um, just to take another concrete example of this issue, the, the Westinghouse deal with China over the AP1000 nuclear reactor has been much criticized by some people because that's a that's American science developed in part with federal funding, and the Westinghouse deal with China was that that over time they will transfer the IP to China for the domestic market in China. China gets gets that IP for their own markets over time. And so a lot of people say, oh, well, we shouldn't have let the Chinese have that IP. Well, okay, that's, that, that's a fair point. On the other hand, uh, you know, China is building four AP-1000s right now. Because the Ch Chinese went first, now we're you know, building a couple in this country. The Ch Chinese are planning on building 50 of them. The, the jump start on the US nuclear industry that we're getting out of the Chinese activity to me is priceless and I think at the end of the day you know the answer to the competition uh, question is at the end of the day we have to accept that America you know each country has its own economic niche and so we'll get a piece of the action but the Chinese market is the really big one that's where they're building things that's where they are growing hugely that's where their demand for new energy is just staggering and so if we can get even a small portion of the business in China while we develop technologies that we can then bring back to the United States and and, and sell to the world I think we're we get ahead of ourselves. And so in my mind, this isn't the zero sum game. Every you know, piece of IP that the Chinese get is one less that we have. No, I think the answer is this is how do we grow the pie? How do we help companies like PowerSpan go over to China and then in partnership with the Chinese? Yes, maybe they're sharing their, their IP, but they're also selling it to the world. With, with China, and you know, I, I think in terms of the climate, which is what I care about, that's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Mike, does, that, does the competition worry you, that, uh, that idea? No. No. I mean, yeah, we should leave all this to Rob's panel this yeah, afternoon sorry. on yeah. China. <laughs> but, no. Uh, but no, I, I mean, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a stupid oversimplification, but I mean, they're huge, they're growing, uh, they, they need energy. We saw the curves this morning, it's a national security issue if we're all going to fight over the same barrel of oil in some unstable other country. I mean, all these things, and to the extent that we can invent, we can export, we can help, I, I just, I think a rising tide raises all ships. Okay.
Elon, what technologies that are out there that you're, I mean, you, you have a privileged position, I think, in, in where you are right now. What really excites you that could be on the horizon? And now we can talk about lab toys, because this could be fun. You know, that's, that's out there that hasn't really got to that point, but you think, you know, can be very promising, and then that maybe we'll see in five or 10, ten years' time. Um, a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'll use one, it's hard to pick which one, but I'll use one example. Uh, RPE just launched five new programs, and one of them in particular I think is both really exciting and I think draws out some of the issues we've talked about. It's a program called Genie, which stands for um, Grid, uh, hold on, Green Integration, Green Energy Network Integration. Sorry, we, we come up with these acronyms and then it's very easy to figure out exactly what they, we know what they do. We know what the projects are based on. No last e, so, right. so Green Energy Network inter Integration, and the idea here is um, basically, when you look at, this is amazing to me, I mean, I, I'm a PhD in, in material science. I went through life being fascinated by science, being fascinated by all sorts of phenomena in the world. And it wasn't until I did my PhD and then I started working in energy and probably not really till I came to RPE did I start learning about how our electricity grid works. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. which in itself, you know, should should trigger some alarms, right? That you know, it is absolutely miraculous that you can plug something into the into the electricity plug in your house and um, and get electricity out. Because basically, you know, we can only generate, we can only take electrons off the grid as soon as they're created. We have to time that exactly all over the grid. Um, there's there's no storage. So think about basically Walmart having to deliver. You know, but when you walk into Walmart, you, they need to deliver whatever product you want as soon as you walked in, walk in, and they're not allowed to have any warehouses, and they're not allowed to have any shelves, and it has to be done exactly when it comes off the manufacturing line, right? And, and so we, we don't have storage on the grid. We also can't control uh, where electrons go on the grid. It turns out that electrons just follow a path of least resistance. So if you have uh, you know, a power plant over here, and a load over here and all of a sudden you need another 100 megawatts on your load, you can't just turn on this power plant another 100 megawatts and route that power to that load. It just doesn't work that way. Right? You energize the grid and you're lucky if maybe 10 megawatts makes it to the, to the load. Um, so we have, we, existing, we have an existing program on, on grid scale energy storage, which is to say, okay, let's build some warehouses onto the grid for mm -hmm. electrons. Um, but this new and program... I'm sorry, that's with batteries, or is it, what sort of format are you looking at? So, so the way our programs work is we, we generally say, here's what we want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. We want to store energy at you know, a tenth the cost of what energy storage with large scale batteries on the grid might look like today. Here's the, the target. Uh, whatever ideas you have, they can do it. So some of the, some of the projects, we have a, b a variety of projects that are all addressing this issue. Uh, some of them are new battery technologies, flow batteries. Some of them are fly advanced flywheel technologies, um, trying to get these to a next generation, um, and, and several others. The, the battery based on, um, based on aluminum smelting, the one I mentioned before, is, is one in that program. So, so Genie is now a program where, where we say, well, what if, what about being able to actually route power on the grid, right? Can we come up with ways to, to take, you know, take 100 megawatts that you turn on over here and actually, rather than just have it go path of least resistance to all over the grid, actually route it to, to where it needs to go? And it turns out there are some technologies that have existed to be able to do that, to take electricity coming in one line and switch and say, I want 30% of it to go over to this line, 30% uh, to go here, and 40% to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, there are only about a small handful of examples of these facilities being built around the world. And the reason is because the technology is extremely expensive. Right? Um, we have a program director who actually came from the power electronics space uh, who said, well look, transistors are, are getting more and more capable of being able to handle high voltages. We can take solid state transistors, the type of stuff that we've been developing for computers, and turn them into high voltage and actually try and do solid state switches on the grid. Mm -hmm. And so we put it out there and we actually think, based on, the, based on all the ideas we've gotten back, that we might be able to reduce the cost of these switching technologies by a factor of 10 all the way up to a factor of 100. And so if there are five of them today when each of these systems costs $55 million, um, if it costs $5 million or $500,000, you can imagine having these now all over the grid and having the grid actually be able to be smart in the sense of being able to route power. 
Um, it's a nice idea, mm -hmm. and the technology, the hardware technology, is is within reach, we believe. But then you start thinking about all the other issues, right? So, right, I was going to ask, yeah, because it seems yeah. to be, once you get into the grid, you're getting into a very, right. uh, so, with nothing to do with technology, a lot to do with politics. Yeah, well, so, and, and one of those examples is when we, when we decide how to dispatch power on the grid, we basically clear the markets either every hour, sometimes every five minutes. And when we do that, we actually have to run an optimization of where's all the power going to go come from and where's it going to go to. And today, that's actually a relatively you know, it, all things considered simple because there's just one grid. Now we're talking about a technology to enable you to have a grid that can transform, right? Where you can decide where things are gonna go. Mm -hmm. Turns out the software side of this, all these optimizations are extremely complex. So part of this program is also including folks who developed some of the best algorithms from the internet and thinking about how we route mm -hmm. packets of information and applying those problems now to the grid. Um, so we're trying to, to tackle some of the different problems here. A and then the question is, well, even still, you haven't solved the problem because uh, we still need market mechanisms to have these things go on, on the grid, et cetera. And, and that's where I think a lot of the alignment comes in. It's, well, how will these things get dispatched? How will the markets be created for the grid? Um, and, and what we're seeing from a technology perspective is there really is a chance for this to look completely different, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and we're going to solve that piece, and we need you know we need help to solve the other pieces. So mm -hmm. so we're trying to bring that all together. Right. One last question. Um, you, someone said earlier here about the importance of starting with an end in mind, knowing knowing where you're going on this. Just very quickly, I guess each of you, you know, what is the end in mind you hope for the system we have right now? What is it you actually want to see ultimately that we should be working towards? Global decarbonization. Uh, Preferably by mid-century, more or less. Okay. Um, and and, and I, I agree, it's important to focus on that end. As I said, I think you know the process of political coalition building, where we bring in a lot of the other interests, and you get people who are concerned about American competitiveness and so forth. I think that's distorting from an environmental point of view. I would really ask people to try to keep focusing on the question of global innovation, not in the U.S., not you know who gets what piece of the pie, but what advances the technology. Okay. Right. Well, I'd like to. I'd like this to lead to. Uh, I actually, someone said it this morning, which was, um, we should expect more out of our national laboratory system, and I think that's right. I think you can, um, but I don't think we're challenging it enough, and I don't think we have it sort of organized in the right way to do that. But we need to go back to its roots, which were the Manhattan Project, and being able to do the truly extraordinary and ask it to do that for this country. And we ought to be asking ourselves, what does the word national mean in national labs? And how is it we can bring them back to uh, that place where they can truly serve this nation in a, in a, in a much greater way? Um, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll quote our fearless leader, Arun, who, and I'm not sure if he, he mentioned these words specifically, but um, I mean, he likes to basically say that the, the technologies we're supporting, we hope, are the foundation for, um, you know, the national security of the U.S., the economic security of the U.S., of the U.S., and the environmental security of the U.S. US. And, and I guess I'd say, you know, if you look at a, a, just one of our programs like, like the Genie, like routing power on the grid, um, you know, the inefficiencies of not being able to do that today add up to, you know, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars um, that, that could be saved by adding these capabilities. Um, you know, using the Walmart analogy, right, when you think of put, about putting high amounts of renewables on the grid, you're talking about the same problem, but now you can't actually control when your manufacturing lines are on mm -hmm. and off and when the products are coming on. Much tougher problems. So this is another solution to that, to allow us to really have uh, a renewable fueled electricity grid um, in the U.S. and and you know ultimately be be weaning ourselves off of foreign energy sources. So um, I, you know, I think it's those three things and making dramatic impacts on all those fronts. Great. All right. Well, please join me in thanking our panel. Uh, Brian, thank you, and uh, thank you to all the panelists. We're going to jump right into the next panel. I should add, by the way, we got a little taste of the next panel after that, which will be after the break on China, which uh, I think you'll hear a very interesting and, and hopefully uh, uh, not too contentious uh, debate about uh, the role of China when it comes to clean energy innovation and whether it's good or bad.
Let me also mention a couple other things. One, to reminder for folks, if you want to tweet about the conference, it's uh, hashtag Energy Innovation 11. You go get your mic. Are you doing this panel? Yeah, go get your mic. <laughs> 